For those in the meeting room and those watching us via FB Live streaming, our hashtags are information as public good and WPFD 2021. This form can also be viewed on the FB pages of NUJP, ECIJ, CMFR, Media News, and PPI to officially open our forum. Please welcome from UNESCO Jakarta, the advisor for inform for communication information, Dr. Ming Kuk Lim. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. And thank you so much for uh, the organizer of the event to involve uh, UNESCO in uh, this celebration and this event uh, during and on the World Press Freedom Day uh, 2021. And the theme of World Press Freedom Day this year is uh, information as public good. My name is Ming Kuo Lim. I'm the advisor for communication and information for UNESCO's office based in Jakarta. Uh, it is my pleasure to participate in this event today. Um, as I said, the theme for World Press Freedom Day is uh, information as a public good. It serves as a call to affirm the importance of cherishing information as a public good and exploring what can be done in the production, distribution, and reception of content. This theme ties in with UNESCO's efforts uh, to ensure the long-term health of independent journalists and journalism and safety of media workers, men and women everywhere. This includes the UN Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists and the issue of impunity. More specifically, this year we want to look at three uh, issues and three pers uh, perspectives. That is the viability of media and news organization in this day and age the transparency of online platforms and how it impacts journalism, the link between media and information literacy and in the countering of disinformation and hate speech. The current pandemic has increased the pressure on journalism and journalists. The pandemic has also exacerbated the existing challenges with many uh, uh, media outlets uh, suffering financial losses, um, the rise in the power of the internet or the online platform um, are further entrenched. And this current lockdown lifestyle have really locked us into an online mode as well. The fact that we are now uh, talking to each other via this platform. And false information and rumors have flourished. Uh, in some cases with fatal consequences, as we have seen with a lot of the anti-vaxxers uh, information being spread around online. Indeed, the pandemic has really underlined an ever urgent need for reliable, verifiable information. It is independent journalism that has helped us make sense of this crisis. Journalists have reported from the field, even at great personal risk. Many have been threatened, detained, harassed, especially women journalists. At least 62 journalists were killed for their work in 2020. Many more lost their lives to COVID-19. At the same time, we know women journalists also face unprecedented online harassment and threats. This is reflected in the latest UNESCO report um, titled The Chilling, uh, Global Trends on Online uh, Harassment and Violence Against Women Journalists, which uh, was based on a global survey of over 900 journalists uh, in over 125 countries with case studies, as well as two big data case studies assessing 2.5 million posts on Facebook and Twitter directed at two prominent uh, women journalists, including Maria Ressa in the Philippines. So ladies and gentlemen, as we mark the World Press Freedom Day this year in 2021, we salute journalists everywhere for their continuing effort to provide public interest information and journalism. We owe them, we owe you, the members of the press in the audience, a debt of gratitude. And we call on everyone to renew their commitment to the fundamental right of freedom of expression, press freedom, to defend media workers, and to join us in ensuring that information remains a public 
Good. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thanks, Dr. Ming, for setting the tone of the World Press Freedom Day celebration this year. To give the state of media freedom in the Philippines is the executive director of the Center for Media Freedom Responsibility, Ms. Melinda Kinsley Jesus, and she will be joined by our panel of reactors later after her presentation. Ms. Melinda, we give the floor to you. Good afternoon, everyone. By law, let me say first that I am going to go through a lot of background because I don't think we can understand the many things that are going on without actually remembering and setting on the record how things have developed through the years, recent as well as longer backgrounds. By law, Duterte's presidency ends in 2022. And this renders the assessment of press freedom in the Philippines in a new light. The next election confronts the nation with a fork on the road. We either turn the page or we stay with the status quo. Filipinos must make their choice with a conscious review of the state of the nation, of which the state of the press and its freedom is only part, albeit a critical one. We must take note of the larger global context as well. For the election of President Duterte in 2016 counted him among other strong men leaders whose rise in power signified the wave of populism, a trend toward greater authoritarianism and the decline of democracy around the world. The emergence of an undemocratic China as a major global power should also be considered even in our national situation. This annual assessment of press freedom should serve as an examination of how far down the road of authoritarianism the country has come and the consequences of this drift. It is accurate to say that the administration of Rodrigo Roa Duterte has behaved quite unlike a democratic government. Actually, that is an understatement. Duterte has conducted himself as a feudal or political warlord, relying on shock and awe tactics to ensure submission of the population to his will and to his way. But many Filipinos did not mind the willfulness of the strongman president. With so many struggling just to survive from day to day, submission or resignation has been a common response to all government. Even before the pandemic, the majority of Filipinos have borne the burden of desperate poverty and hardship. You cannot expect those who suffered daily the urban blight, the endless traffic, the lack for their basic needs, to be concerned about political questions or to be inclined even to evaluate how well or how poorly they are being served. While democracy promotes freedom and equality of all, in many countries it is precisely these, this inequality, the unfairness in the experience of public good that is added to the appeal of the so-called populist message and the pro-poor platform. To strengthen his position, President Duterte also expressed his hostility against so-called wealthy oligarchs. In power as president, he immediately established the securitization of policy and program implementation, promoting the status of military and pol police agencies to establish control in civilian life, the outcome of which has been the massive loss of human rights as politicians quickly shifted their allegiance to the ruling coalition, the executive quickly dominated Congress, eliminating an instrument for check and balance. And with the unprecedented attack on the independence of the Supreme Court, the government demolished the power of the judiciary to effectively check presidential will and executive power. We cannot talk about the media without this larger political context. Our concern today focuses particularly on the impact of the Duterte presidency on the press of, and or media as an institution or as a community and the most obvious of all on the coverage of news. 
As we celebrate World Press Freedom Day, we need to engage in a review of the values reflected in the conduct of our work and in our role in society. How well have we all fulfilled our mandate to build an informed citizenry? And what values have we upheld in the coverage of our news? The media, let us remember, operates within a society and thus reflects the nature of that society. And reporting the news, the media holds up a mirror to the images, the ideas, the insights, and yes, the values expressed in a way of life. The press works according to a set of values, but the capacity to reflect and to hold up a mirror may be affected by values that rule society to ensure quality and freedom in journalism, those who work in the media must deepen both their individual as well as the institutional values that rule their practice. And journalistic practice that relies only on recording what he said, she said, does the job with less questioning, less probing scrutiny of the subject covered. Such, cover, such kind of coverage merely echoes what is going on. And if there is a strong authoritarian impulse, then it lets the elected power to do as he or she fits without question or criticism. This kind of reporting has allowed those who govern to revise our standards for presidential conduct, for public decency, and for good taste. Journalistic coverage has let pass the claim that government was doing something to act on the aggressive presence of China in the West Philippine Sea, even as it debunked the arbitral ruling which favored our claim by the Hague Court. It has reported without interpretation the primacy of law enforcement agencies in implementing programs and the enhanced militarization and consequent marginalization of human rights, public interest, and common good. <clears throat> there has been little analysis about the impact of the country's buy into the pogo industry, into the massive Silk Road branding, China's imprint on the national infrastructure program, and either one which has inundated the country with foreign workers here in a country that has been for so long sending Filipinos to work abroad. Surely it is obvious that the president's pivot to China raises questions about how we look at our national interest. As Filipinos, we need to ask ourselves, how did we let this happen? Our country was an unlikely home for this global shift. Its history was rooted in the national struggle of independence from colonial power, the first to succeed in Asia. And in a liberal framework that protected free expression and press freedom from laws, provided for no less than its constitutions of 1935 and 1987. I think I need a next slide. As Filipinos, we need to ask ourselves, how did we let this happen? But numerous scholarly studies have underlined the fact and the reality of how Philippine democracy has been seeded in the soil, which was perhaps not sufficiently enriched with the nutrients required for democracy to thrive. Societal structures did not open up enough to allow institutional checks and balances. The forces of clan and family were retained and legitimized as political dynasties imbued all public affairs as though these were their own family enterprise. Indeed, news organizations themselves have reflected so much of this political culture Despite the constitutional protection of the autonomy of media and liberal values and the legal framework that has benefited the community in the country, we have not always been impervious to state pressure and enough journalists have been willing to follow government's lead with obsequious, slavish coverage. 
The most recent and dramatic example has been the wholesale co-optation of the press by Ferdinand Marcos when he ruled through martial law from 1972 until 1986. And only then, when people gathered their forces on the streets to force them, the government, and their officials to exile. However, let us not forget we can still claim that even under repressive conditions which held in various periods in the past, there have always been journalists who stood apart to sustain the function of the fourth estate and check abuse of power. The alternative press has taken many forms and it is still showing itself the courage, the fortitude, the will to speak truth to power. The Duterte administration has succeeded to control the flow of information and dominate coverage, but there are forces in the media who retain their fearless independence. The question now is whether these forces will again gain the people's support or if these forces will be reduced only to a voice in the wilderness. Our next slide will show so much of what had gone on. And we all know these now as part of our experience, but I suggest that we force ourselves to recall them. This brief review indicates that the actual interaction of the president with members of the press has been quite minimal. And yet the impact on the press has been the most dramatic of the country's drift towards authoritarianism and even the tyranny of national leadership. Within the first six months, with media restraining its natural impulse to criticize for the tradition of a honeymoon with a new government, the administration unleashed the savage force of Tokhang against poorest communities Army trolls and his genuine supporters carried out a massive social media campaign to demonize the mainstream press, along with ceaseless attacks on the political opposition. The connection between troll armies and the palace communications office became visible as social media influencers were given positions in government or were featured in palace programs. In 2017, the intimidation of media, particularly of their owners set in, instilling an almost visceral fear, a deep seated terror being made a target of unfounded charges. In his second year in office, President Duterte singled three media organizations which had proactively investigated the rising number of deaths from government war on drugs and then proceeded to act on these threats. Like a contagion, the animosity toward the free press spread among government officials at all levels who adopted the president's own bullying stance, initiating an array of actions against the press, the range of which I will present as recorded in CMFR's database and in consultation and agreement with the NUJP. The question then is, is there press freedom still in the Philippines? The answer is yes, as the press community itself is also divided. Actually, the answer one gets depends on who you ask. The press, like the rest of the population, is divided, working as it were in separate cells, even in the same news organizations, or as news organizations form opposing camps. In some newsrooms, efforts were made to discourage stories that would put the president and the administration in a poor or a bad light. Only recently, CMFR has noted takedowns or modifications of original reports, self-censorship of the most open kind. One senses a lack of institutional solidarity with a community of journalists watching out for one's own interests alone, perhaps, and not caring about how other organizations fare, as though the institution itself 
did not exist. Where is the future for this divided press? The answer may depend on who the public believes more. But bear in mind that even the public opinion polls are now being questioned because in an atmosphere of limited information and fear, these methods may no longer make sense. The conditions are complex. The constitution remains simplicity, the sanctuary of our protection. But whether even this is effective enough requires an extended and nuanced discussion. We look to the COVID-19 crisis. International media watchdogs noted a pattern of restrictions on the press and the free speech during the pandemic. Quarantine conditions inherently restrict all activities, but more in some cases than others. Filipino journalists were required to submit to accreditation, adding another layer of bureaucratic involvement in the press conduct. Everyone knows that such credentials then can be withdrawn for no reason at all. Pandemic conditions heightened the securitization of all government conduct, which made media workers more vulnerable to close examination at checkpoints and to heighten surveillance. The economic impact of the lockdowns in different places also caused the demise of numerous daily and weekly news publications in their original vigor and format. Based on the communities where these press outlets constituted a level of democratic discourse, this level has now been seriously threatened. Lately, all the community papers which suspended publications have reportedly returned with both digital and print issues, but regularly or irregularly as the case may be, we have yet to check if these are doing more or less independently as they did in the past. And we have a reactor to probably give us some more of this outlook. But there is good news in the resilience of community radio. But unfortunately, radio in this country has been dependent on government information, on chat programs that are politically sponsored through the system of block timing. So whether radio can provide the force among communities to assist them in their political choices remains an open question. There have been other restrictions in the time of COVID-19. The effect on the access to information is deeply felt. With poor Wi-Fi conditions, the digital meetings are difficult to maintain and poor connectivity can easily be used as a cover for officials who just don't want to give an answer. Some officials have resorted to prepackaged text online briefings on a take it or leave it basis. There are less and less of them who bother to return calls to answer questions or to clarify the issues that are raised by their briefings. PCIJ reported how the low response rate of government worsened during the quarantine period. A review from March 13 to May 27 showed that only one out of 10 requests filed before the government's FOI portal received an answer. Furthermore, loss of officialized restrictions to, re to press reporting. Two laws passed in 2020 included provisions that legalized penalties for passing fake news, adding to those in the anti-cybercrime law, which have been contested already in the courts, and the latter lost in the high court. Among the provisions expanding presidential powers to address COVID-19 is the Bayanihan to heal as one, which places in the hands of government the determination of what constitutes fake news and its penalties. Another legislation, the anti-terror law, is now being challenged in the Supreme Court for its unconstitutional provisions, including those that could be used by police and military to curtail legitimate criticism with at least two cases already recorded for the arrest or of critical media practitioners. The Supreme Court 
began hearing oral arguments against the Anti-Terror Act last week. The declaration of the High Court will be a major factor in shaping the future of the press. Its implementation will further tighten government's hold over the once free press of the country. But that discussion should also reopen on why there is a need for cyber libel law. In this culture of fear that we should understand existed even before the pandemic has deepened and it has effectively controlled newsrooms. The effective closure of the country's major broadcast network, ABS-CBN, was an unprecedented act of state power which struck at the core of the media system and its communities, leaving the, com leaving the community still shaken by the experience because if this can happen to ABS-CBN, then it can happen to others. We should have a response. We should question why franchise power has been regulated in political hands. Why Congress? The counterinsurgency campaign pursued by the National Task Force to end local communist armed conflict, or the NTFL CAC, has used red tagging, which has included journalists. This unit is chaired by the president himself. The practice of quickly labeling individuals or groups as supporters of the Communist Party of the Philippines, the New People's Army, and the National Democratic Forum Front endangers victims, including journalists, of being hauled to court on trumped up charges such as illegal possession of firearms, make them vulnerable to harassment or worse. We had not even counted as a threat or attack, but flag. The role of the National Intelligence Coordination Committee in holding forums for community media where members are asked to sign on to a manifesto of commitment, a declaration of their wholehearted, I quote, wholehearted support and commitment to the implementation of President Rodrigo R. Duterte's regional task force to end local communist armed conflict. In this kind of situation, asking journalists to sign makes the act compelling. The state of the community press reveals where and how journalists are most vulnerable as police and military actions can occur with less national attention, attention delaying all kinds of assistance and protection. Also, with a level of familiarity within a community, it is easier to intimidate without exerting too much force. For this reason, we are hoping to work with NUJP members on the ground to invigorate the reporting on attacks and threats as they happen, which have evolved all kinds of actions given the changing environment in Philippine journalism. There is permanent damage to access of information and to press freedom practice. Within the two years of lockdown and quarantine, some of the practices adopted because of the pandemic may become ingrained. The reporter Sans Frontier, Secretary General Christophe Delois, summed up the warning, and I quote, what will freedom of information, pluralism, and reliability look like in 2030? The answer to that question is being determined today, unquote. Self-censorship, the wariness of other owners of news organizations hold up the dark clouds over the press prospects of press freedom in the Philippines. CMFR has begun to track numerous issues left uninvestigated, stories untold that people have a right to know about. The overall effect is government's control over the news agenda. CMFR's Media Monitor counts government officials as the predominant sources in the news. They set the news narrative, and they are generally given more space and time than those who oppose them. As other international media watchdog organizations have pointed out, the pandemic has exacerbated the crisis of limited information and government control 
which has been going on with the democratic decline. Let us go to the cases of attacks and threats. From the CMFR database, We have counted 223 incidents as reported from June 20, 30, 2016 to April 30, 2020. These included various levels of harassment, verbal and physical assault, intimidation, libel charges, and the banning of journalists from coverage. It also includes the 19 journalists killed. We started our database on the killings of journalists in 1992, verifying the reported 32 cases, which at the time had already ranked us as high as those killed in countries in which had actual war zones, actually fighting battles. Our killings map has been upgraded to include more information about the cases collected then. The FMFA exercise on Press Freedom Day has involved both CMFR and NUJP, whose members support from the ground to evaluate cases together for more enhanced verification. Since June 30, 2016 to April 30, 2021, the 223 incidents of attacks and threats also include the 19 journalists killed. All were male victims. Four were killed in 2020 during the period of the pandemic. Cornelio Pepino on May 5, two days after World Press Freedom Day celebration. Jobert Bercasio on September 4, Virgilio Maganes on November 8, and Ronnie Villamore on November 17. 13 worked in radio, five in print, and one online. Nine of those killed were from Mindanao, seven from Luzon, and three from the Visayas, five from the Big Cold region, four from Soxargen, three from Central Visayas, two each from Western Mindanao and from Caraga, and one from Davao region. CMFR notes the increase in the number of intimidation and libel cases in 2020. Cases of intimidation include red tagging, surveillance, and other kinds of harassment, including threats to file cases against journalists, including doxing and extortion. Of the 51 cases of intimidation from June 20, from June 30, 2016 to 2021, 30 were incidents of red tagging. And there are a number of cases in the database, the details of which you can check directly. Five incidents of surveillance were also recorded surveillance, including police visits and vehicle tailing. 22 or 43% of these incidents were recorded during the pandemic. 37 cases of libel and oral defamation. No, just please keep it, keep, don't present this, this slide first, sh Shally. 22 or 43 percent of these incidents were recorded during the pandemic. Let us go into the libel, where 37 cases of libel and oral defamation were recorded from June, from 2016 to 2021. 18 of these were online libel. Eight of 37 cases involved actual arrests. So if you are thinking that the increased legalization of on the issue of defamation has not increased the danger of being taken to court, please watch the data closely. 20 or 54% of these libel cases were done even during the pandemic and a predominant number of them have been held in the national capital region. Let us now have the slide on state perpetrators. Can I have the next slide, please? 
We have 114 identified state agents, the LGU, 38, from the police, 34, national government, 34, and military, 8. CMFR had already called attention to the increased involvement of state agents as perpetrators with 114 out of 223 cases. This is a notable increase that indicates the position that government officials have taken in dealing with the press. We have also noted the increased reporting of other attacks and threats under the Duterte administration. We have received more. This may be out of the greater sense of danger for media and journalists, and they may have begun to report the incidents out of a sense of need that these should be known by more journalists and more associations. In conclusion, we should make the effort to find hope and strength in the global solidarity expressed by World Press Freedom Day. And this is not an easy thing to do. The landscape of press freedom has long been darkened by the endemic violence seeded by gun culture, evident in so many aspects of public life. This aspect of our national culture should be understood as a major deterrent to democratic practice. The latter, democracy, promotes expression from, from all those involved in fights and feuds that they settle their agree disagreements at the table to discuss their differences on all communication peaceably. Since 2016, administration has deepened the political will, will, the political, sorry, as well as the cultural differences, highlighting and encouraging hate speech and all kinds of hostility on all communication platforms. There has been an unleashing of the forces of hate and violence, first through the indiscriminate killings as part of the drug campaign, through the bombing and destruction of Marawi, through the overzealous punishment of those failing to comply with curfew or other measures. Take the example of the Barangay Tanod wanting to punish a youth who may have simply stepped out of his home for a breath of fresh air and found himself having to run for his life. Once our keepers of the law lose their way, violence, guns, and weapons become a way of life. And so today we must pledge ourselves to use the news as a way out of this dark place. Let us shine the light on the goodness that Filipinos have shown in the midst of so much suffering. The great capacity of the poor to share what little they have the custom of our country, Damayan, Kikiramay, Bayanihan. Let there be no mistake about where the press stands when something like the community pantry is made to look bad or dubious in terms of its intent. Indeed, how else can we counter the forces of anger and hate but to report the simplicity of doing good? Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Ma'am Melinda, for the incisive and comprehensive presentation. For all this data and other data, you can actually click the website of the Center for Indifferent Responsibility. Please hold on to your questions until the open forum. You can key in your comments and questions in the chat room for those in the meeting room. And we'll also be getting from those who are watching us live via FB streaming. At this point, it's now time for our panelists or reactors to give their reactions. Each of the panelists or reactor will give a 10 minute, will be given 10 minutes for his or her case. We start with Jonathan De Santos, the chairperson of the National Youth Journalist of the Philippines to give us the threats on the ground. Jonathan, please. Please, sir. Um, Hi. Good afternoon. Um, the, the earlier presentation already gave a good overview of the threats, uh, the threats that we face. So uh, I'll just give like uh, I'll try to give a face to the reports. Okay, so um, a confluence of uh, calamities in 2020 
from the Taal eruption to typhoons and the COVID-19 pandemic further highlighted the risky conditions that many journalists in the Philippines have to work with. In roundtable discussions, co colleagues talked about having to rush to cover the eruption in January 2020 with little support from the news desk. In many cases, providing protective equipment like face masks is up to individual journalists and, infor and informal journalist groups organizing swaps and donations. In many cases, because of shrinking editorial budgets and because contributors are paid per piece used, coverage was done without a guarantee of at least breaking even on travel and other expenses. Violence and harassment also compounded the risks faced by journalists who already had to contend with limited transportation options and limited access to information on pandemic response. Uh, like proper wages, the provision of proper safety equipment is a press freedom issue. Threats over critical stories were a common theme in the roundtable discussions. Some were sent through anonymous text messages and others uh, over televised Senate hearings on red tagging. One journalist who was at the Senate to cover the hearing was put in the awkward position of having to leave quietly when he was included among those red tagged, along with an entire network of alternative media outfits. Four journalists were killed in 2020, bringing the total killed to 2019. Uh, while many of the respondents in the, in the discussion said their newsrooms had safety protocols against harassment and other threats, uh, other practitioners have had, have had to design their own precautions, have had to come up with their own uh, protocols to keep themselves safe. Uh, newsrooms and journalists also face the threat of cyber libel and similar charges under the Bayania to Heal as One Act over stories that those in power take issue with. As we mark World Press Freedom Day, uh, for example, Guru Press, a community newspaper and website in Kalinga Province, announces that its editors are facing cyber libel charges from Tabuk City Mayor Darwin Estraniero over allegations of corruption in transactions for land and for thermal scanners. Uh, while the editors of Guru Press say they will face the charge, the threat of legal action has given many other news to lose pause. Community station radio the Natin Gimba in Navaisia also faces a complaint for alleged violation of the Bayanian Tahilas 1 Act. The station earlier faced complaints of cyber libel and violation of Bayanian Act, uh, filed by the mayor in 2020 over reports on the local government's social amelioration program. Uh, although most of these have been dismissed, one is still active. Red tagging has also continued with Mindanao Gold Star Daily's uh, Con Corrales again being included in posters accusing him of being a member of the Communist Party of the Philippines, this time in connection with community printings. This labeling has not been limited to regional newsrooms, uh, with, with one general calling Inquirer.net reporter Ted Torres Tupas a propagandist for reporting on a petition filed at the Supreme Court related to the anti-terrorism act. That same general hinted that she may think face charges for simply reporting. Despite a public outcry, there was no accountability over that statement, as there has been none over similar accusations by government officials or their agents. This labeling has led to harassment, raids, and arrests. Uh, just on Sunday, uh, police raided the house of student journalist Justin Macias in the Raga Albay. Uh, Macias, who is senior editor of college publication Casiti Online, was not home at the time of the raid, although police uh, who had earlier tagged, uh, red tagged her, claimed they had recovered a pistol and excluded explosives from her, from her his house. On April 24, a uh, Northern Dispatch reporter Kim Ambalos and his companions, who had traveled to Kalinga to attend the unveiling of a monument, was harassed by town police and told that people from leftist groups were not welcome in Tilayan. Uh, last year, Margarita Valle, a veteran journalist in Davao City, was arrested in Cagayan de Oro and held incommunicado for hours until police admitted that she had been nabbed uh, in a case of mistaken identity. The Office of the Ombudsman dismissed complaints of kidnapping and serious illegal detention against the police in October 2020, saying uh, lapses, uh, lapses were understandable since both uh, Valle and the suspect they were looking for are elderly and have short hair. Manila Today State Ann Salem, arrested last December over guns and exclusive charges, has been freed and the case against her has been jumped. But a Cloban City journalist, Frenchie May Cumpia, remains in detention over guns and explosives that police also said they found in a raid uh, in February last year. Cumpia had been reporting on human rights issues and land grabbing in, in the area and had reported surveillance and intimidation prior to her arrest. Even Masbate journalist Ronnie Villamar's death in November was framed as part of an encounter with soldiers who were in the area uh, to check on reports of armed men there. 
this despite colleagues saying that William Moore and his companions had coordinated the local police uh, on their coverage there. Uh, these incidents, as well as instances of surveillance, harassment, and attacks on journalists, has contributed to a chilling effect that is as chilling, if not more, than those caused by government actions against ABS-CBN and Rappler. All of these are happening in the context of a constant government attempt to discredit media and to put primacy on official narratives. These incidents call for a more united response from the community of independent journalists, and we hope that World Press Freedom Day is one avenue for that. Uh, the number of different activities marking this day gives us reason to hope that greater public awareness of us, of the work that we do, and the issues that we face will translate to greater public support for journalism and for our freedoms. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Please hold on uh, to uh, your, your comments and uh, uh, at least reactions for from our audience a little later in the open forum. Okay, and speaking of threats underground, let's talk about the impacts of the pandemic on community media already mentioned by Mamelinda Kanina in her presentation on the various threats and uh, challenges faced by our colleagues outside Metro Manila. To present is Amalia Cabuso. She is the vice president of the Philippine Press Institute, also the editor-in-chief of, of Mindanao Times. Please welcome Ami. Hi, Ami. How are you? Hi, hi, Ariel. I'm good. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah, can you hear me? Um, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. okay. So, yeah, uh, I will be uh, talking about the impacts of the pandemic on the community media. The Philippine Press Institute conducted three consultations in November last year under its program, Caring Under the Pandemic, uh, checking on the situation of the community media. The results of that are in this report. So, yeah. I, how do I... I sorry. I <laughs> how am I going to I can't. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wait, I can share my screen. Mm. We can see your uh, first slide already. All you oh, have okay, to do okay, is okay. Yes, just yeah, click okay. It. So yeah. yeah. So um yeah, in the Luzon forum last year, uh, PPI chair Estabilio said that we have to be realistic. The in thing, the new norm, is that we are shifting towards digital. With this, there is no escaping progress. We have got to adapt. As I said before, anything that disrupts the flow of information is a good thing because that means there is pro progress. So the COVID-19, uh, I cannot see my slide. Okay. See, Shali. Okay, I cannot. Uh, started see sharing your, uh, yeah. Ah, she, she shared screen. my yeah, slide. Yeah. Ah, okay. Screen. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. okay. I'm, 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 so the COVID 19 pandemic has an unimaginable, devastating impact across the world in all aspects of human endeavor. For community papers that have, for the past couple of years, already been suffering from dwindling revenue, we are gasping for breath to be able to survive. So everything. We are seeing at this moment is a con uh, is a contraction. So is Shali uh, doing my screen sharing thing? Because I'm always lost. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah. It's full screen now. I mean. Yeah. Ah, okay. So uh, yeah. So we have uh, um, most of the newsrooms have to let go of correspondence because newspapers are financially strapped to make them regular employees and provide the benefits. So we have to let go of our correspondence. Then we have the shrinking paper. Uh, newspapers had to limit their number of pages due to the increasing price of printing materials. And we factor in uh, transportation difficulties of um, paper and printing equipment and the import restrictions during the pandemic. Okay. And then, so, um, and then loss of revenue, some local advertiser advertisement coming in from both local and national advertisers um, are not coming in. No? And then um, was this, uh, some local advertisers are unable to pay for existing ads and the difficulty also of getting payment. So practically there's no new ads coming in. So we really are suffering. Uh, Next slide. I can't, yes, next slide. The mobility of reporters, most uh, now there's always just mostly virtual pressers, and most of the reporters are working from home. 
uh, with the virtual pressures organized by the government, and this has become the norm. There's also difficulty in getting stories and verifying information because of, lock, of the lockdowns. Next slide. Uh, the lack of resources for safety. Journalists have difficulty not only because of lockdowns, but also on their safety while covering um, the pandemic because they lack uh, PPEs and the newsroom management do not encourage coverage, especially during ECQ or MGCQ. Uh, the last is joblessness uh, with uh, some newspapers closing um, and of course with a, with a retrenchment going on, uh, there are so many reporters who are now jobless. Next. All these things mentioned exacerbated the already difficult situation we were confronted with pre-COVID. One of which, as, as Tess Bakalia pointed out, is the crisis of information. Next, next slide. Uh, Tess said, simply telling people they have their facts wrong is not enough. There is a need to provide a detailed counter message with new information and get the audience to help develop a new narrative to be more effective at correcting misinformation in news accounts and intentionally misleading information. Next slide. So among these prob uh, problems that we have is the flooding and natural calamities. Uh, Vilia Moore Visaya shared during the Luzon conference that um, a reported total damage of 1.2 billion in infrastructure and 1 billion in agriculture resulted from the flooding of the Magat Dam in November 2020 at the time of Typhoon Ulysses. He said that it was his first time to experience that the seven gates of Magat Dam were opened at the same time. He says watersheds and habitat damage of the mountains due to illegal logging and charcoal that contributed to the severe flogging. Flooding. He also cited the watersheds and habitat damage of the mountains due to illegal logging and charcoal that contributed to the severe flooding. In Mindanao, uh, 10 hours of heavy rains brought about by tropical depression Fiki caused massive flooding in the entire province of Agusan del Sur on December 2020, the worst since 2014. In nearby Rosario Town in Agusan del Sur, where small scale mining operation thrives in its hinterlands, uh, the, the flood really hit them the worst. Conflict. So, conflict, next page. Uh, in a statement during the third year of the liberation in Marawi, the Marawi Recon Reconstruction Conflict Watch said, and I quote, it has been three years since the government declared our city liberated, but there is no real liberation to speak of. Most of us have not been allowed to return to our homes and rebuild our lives. So um, that is still a, um, a story that we have to follow up, but it's very difficult at this time. Um, next slide. On December 25, 2027, 20, alleged New People's Army were killed when the Philippine Air Force 50 dropped bombs in Sultan Kudrat. So all this is still going on, even with the pandemic. Um, and then uh, still in about conflict, a town mayor in Maguindanao cheated death after an identified perpetrator set off a roadside bomb in June 2020. So there are also still evacuations going on. Um, Manobo residents fled their homes or fear of getting caught in the crossfire between government forces and the New People's Army. And the, the next would be the threats to the safety of journalists, as mentioned by Mami Linda and jo uh, Mr. Jonathan Santos. So, um, of course, uh, red tagging continues. And this actually was discussed in the previous PPI web webinar last Thursday yeah. uh, on how not to ask questions when journalists were asked to, uh, to talk about uh, their take on um, the, co the community pantry. Um, so, and there's also RA 11479, the Anti Terrorism Act of 2020, uh, which is a provision that would make us more vulnerable to threats, harassment, and even personal harm. And uh, we are signing the petition, uh, the, the um, statement uh, right now. And I hope after this um, forum, we're going to have that uh, published. Um, then, slide 18. Like, uh, everything looks bleak, but as Chair Istabila said, we have to look at this through a positive lens. So the Philippine Press Institute is rolling out digital trends and opportunities to impart digital innovation to struggling members. 
That's how we have to survive in this very difficult time. So we have the um, progressive web app built from web technology like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The benefits of PWA are as follows. No? It can be downloaded and installed without the app store, no download delays or up, up, uh, up, update downtime, and it's accessible in cross-platform interfaces. It's also instant and easy access through any browser and cheaper to build. But there's many more. I just chose some. And then another one is the accelerated mobile uh, pages, AMP. Next slide. It is a project undertaken by Twitter and Google that aims to make the web faster. So next slide. All of these are expected to, to generate a triple increase in daily and ad revenue with faster performance of the web via AMP. So uh, PPI is doing this to help uh, community media survive in this pandemic. And as um, as our chair said, we have to admit that we are really going into uh, the digital phase of our lives. So um, on the digitalization process, PPI will set up right, Ariel, yeah. and create internal shared yeah. VPS hosting for its members and partners. So um, uh, now we're really um, uh, working towards uh, digitalization and having to survive uh, using uh, using this platform. So the major takeaway during last year's consultation during the media forum in the time of pandemic are worth noting. Um, next slide. COVID-19 is being used as a pretext to clamp down the media. The ne next, um, it was stressed by Ms. Bacalia that on the importance of local media, that uh, the local media may be limited in scope, etc. But this, but the work is just as important as the national media. The local media promotes a sense of community when the national media does not cover issues such as funds allotted to cities and provinces, which people do not know really where this went. No. Um, the, the Mindanao Institute of Journalism, Mindanus, also had a uh, regional conference you know, in the six regions. And we also, we talked about where the, the funds you know, for the COVID-19 went. And it was uh, shared by a lot of, uh, we, were, we listened to uh, journalists in the regions if they were able to really um, uh, write about where the funds are uh, spent. You know. uh, next. Um, on the media's role in responding to threats of armed violence and terrorism, I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Caroline Argilias, uh, during the same forum, said that without the media, all we will know about these events are from press releases of the armed forces and other government propagandists. We need to go deeper into what happened, and we will need media to follow up on this, she said. Next slide. So reimagining journalism at this time means more reaffirmation concerning strengthening the principles of journalism. Next. Also, there should be a leverage on the power of digital technologies and community, and for the community to be creative in using these to get more attention. So let me just end by quoting J.B. Bailon, one of PPI's partners, who helped us for so many years. Now. We understand the value of a vibrant and free media. Being a vibrant and free media is a better way to inform the public, which hopefully results in wiser decision, especially during this time of pandemic. Some of them are understandable fears, some are hysterical fears, and the only way to calm down people is for media to be able to do its job freely and responsibly. That's all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ami. Please stand by for the open forum sure. later. Okay. Marami salamat. Okay. I hope you can also share your presentation those who want to have it. Yes, uh, yes. That's, uh, yeah. I can sh I really share it. Yeah. Okay, let's go to broadcast. Uh, let's get your reaction from Mr. R R Roberto Nicdao Jr., the chairperson of the Kapisana ng mga broadcasters sa Pilipinas or KBP to talk about legislated franchises. Thank you, Hi, Ariel. sir. Hi. Hi, hi, Ariel. How are you, Ariel? Long okay naman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oo nga. Hanggang virtual na lang, sir. Okay, virtual. Give the f yeah. <laughs> and thank you, Melinda, for for making me uh, be a part of uh, this forum. Uh, um, you know, I, I was told by, we had a discussion, Melinda, about, I was not supposed to be here, but I, I guess after our short talk, 
you wanted me to be part of it to react about the uh, you know uh, legislating yes. uh, legislating De- broadcast definitely sir oh. mm-hmm. yeah now um just a little background sigur before you know, first i i agree with um uh, everything that melinda said although i had some issues about black time and all that but nevertheless uh just a background the uh, most of the broadcast companies are now in the process of bringing their franchise. The reason is that broadcast franchises have a 25-year life. And if you recall, roughly about 25 years ago, more give or take about three to five years, uh, was the people power. And we were we all applied for, uh, for franchises right after people power. And right now is a time, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on where you sit in the political spectrum, uh, uh, It's 25 years, and uh, we have uh, right now the president who might be friendly or unfriendly to your network, and that's maybe one of the messages probably that that uh, needs to be mentioned here. Uh, and uh, you know, KDP has been uh, lobbying for, and we've been very active in lobbying for uh, the renewal of franchises for all our members. In fact, uh, we've also been active in lobbying even for non-members when we attend the congressional hearings and senate hearings. We lobby for every uh, 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 network that is trying to renew its franchise because it, we feel that it's our duty as uh, the broadcast organization to push for the renewal of all franchises, whether they're KBP members or not. Okay, so we attend the Congress hearings, Senate hearings, and our batting average uh, has been 100% until one network applied for a renewal of franchise. Uh, so that we really feel bad about that. Uh, we fought. We fought really hard, specifically for ABS-CBN. We did back channeling with the congressmen and the senators. We submitted countless position papers, not only by KBP but even uh, uh, other organizations where we're involved. The Ad Foundation, Ad, Ad Standards Council, and so forth and so on. We submitted tons and tons of position paper, and uh, of course, I said we attended all the hearings. Uh, In our, our feeling at that time when we were doing this position papers is that ABS should get this franchise. They cannot do this to the largest network in the country, okay? And in fact, if you look at the timelines, it was leading to that. I mean, on May, March 11, for example, NTC said, and it's a regulator, NTC said it will allow ABS to operate after May, which is the expiration of its franchise, okay? And then on May 1, uh, then Speaker Gaetano says, Congress has no intention of shutting down the network. And then May 3, unfortunately, Sen- uh, Solicitor General uh, Kalida warned the NTC against granting provisional authority to ABS-CBN. And then on May 4, ABS-CBN franchise expires. Following day, even after NTC uh, a couple of months earlier said that they will not, uh, they will allow it to continue, uh, they issued a CDO. Uh, so on May 5, CDO was, was issued. That's the first shutdown. And then on June 25, 29, uh, again, SG Kalida advised NTC to close down ABS, CBN, TV Plus, and Channel 43. Since according to them, uh, the, or according to him, their operations were dependent on the franchise. And then on June 30, uh, that's what we call shutdown too, where Sky Direct and TV Plus channels were uh, shut down. Uh, and then, on, uh, as you know, there, there, there have been hearings. We attended those hearings uh, in Congress. This is, those were the longest hearings ever. I mean, normally when, when we attend the hearings for renewal franchises in Congress, that takes, it takes uh, for the committee to discuss maybe 10 minutes. That's it. You normally we get, e- even with questions against uh, on violations and all that, uh, it'll probably take 10, 15 minutes and then it's passed. Okay. Uh, to be to be sure, uh, we all agree that ABS-CBN is not a saint. It not, may have committed some violations, uh, and the regulators have cited them for several violations. Say NTC, for example, said there was probably some technical violations. VIR said there may be tax violations, and Dole may be from for, for labor violations. But in our view, and I think it's the view of most Filipinos, is that these violations cited during the hearings were not sufficient. Uh, or so, well, number one, they were sufficiently addressed by ABS-CBN, and number two, they were not uh, offenses that merited the death of a network. If at all, they probably benefited some fines or penalties. And it's not, I mean, what, whatever that, and those penalties and fines when we, when we research, they're not even big. They could have been settled very, very, very easily. 
Okay, <clears throat> so I'm just laying down the groundwork here why, why ABS event was closed. It's not because it violated rules, I don't think, because as I said, they've been able to sufficiently answer those questions. Uh, we've, we've provided enough support to them, position papers after position papers. And uh, again, uh, if you look at the, at the rule book of the NTC or even the BIR and so forth, if they actually committed those violations, uh, I'm not admitting that they committed those violations, it would have merited a fine. Okay, not a closure of the network, not a retrieval of all the, of all the frequencies. Okay, and ABS has been the broad, uh, uh, you know, the broadcast uh, plays a key role uh, uh, in info dissemination as, as you, as you, all of the speakers here, uh, Melinda and, uh, and uh, Jonathan and, uh, 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 Amalia uh, uh, mentioned, especially during this time of pandemic. I don't know if I can share some some numbers here, no? uh, how broadcast played a role, and ABS uh, being the uh, largest network contributed immensely to informing the public about the pandemic. Okay, I, uh, let me see if I can share. So. Hang on. Where is it? I don't think it's open. Okay. Here. Do you see that? Can you can you see it now? Yes. Okay. This this were uh, we were provided some uh, research data from uh, Nielsen uh, and Kantar. This is a Nielsen data. I, in fact, uh, the reason I'm showing both Nielsen and the Kantar is so that uh, everyone in the in the call uh, knows that this is not a biased uh, a biased uh, research because Nielsen, as you know, is friendly to one network and Kantar is friendly to another network. So I'm presenting both. This is a Nielsen study that shows that before the pandemic, this is where uh, uh, viewership is, okay? And then it, when, when the pandemic struck, uh, this is TV viewing. It went all the way up here, 23%. In other words, almost one fourth of every Filipino watches TV at any time, okay? From from about 16.8% to 23.7% when, when the uh, ECQ was implemented. <clears throat> When uh, ABS-CBN was shut down, it dropped to pre-pandemic level. So you can see that the cause and effect. Now, the, the reason for the reduction in TV viewing was ABS-CBN's closure. Uh, and then on, uh, uh, there were some launches of uh, some, some other digital channels. On ABS-CBN shutdown, it further went down to 13.8, okay? The next slide is now from Kantar. Uh, by the way, the, the Nielsen was only up to the first uh, half of uh, of 2020. Kantar did a more uh, comprehensive study because it, it it did the whole year of uh, 2020. So it tells you the same story. It started here uh, before the pandemic, and then when we uh, ECQ was implemented, it went up as as uh, was the case of uh, Nielsen, uh, and then ABS even shut down, went back uh, lower than in fact than the pre-pandemic. And then the, when the shutdown number two uh, happened, it went even further down to like 10%. So from, from uh, almost 20%, you were down to like half uh, people viewing TV. Okay. And then uh, of course, uh, ABS-CBN uh, later on uh, in, the, in the fourth quarter of 2020 started using AZ2, A2Z and other, and other uh, channels. Unfortunately, those weren't enough. Uh, those channels were not enough to recover what was lost. Okay, this is just a uh, another uh, slide. These are other slides from from Nielsen showing you the same story that the closure of ABS-CBN didn't mean that uh, those audiences went to other channels. Some did, but for the most part, most of the ABS-CBN audience actually tuned out. Okay, of course, this this is uh, the share uh, pre pre COVID and so forth. This is share. But the share uh, after the shutdown obviously is a much smaller number because a lot of people, as I said, millions of Filipinos just tuned out of TV, okay? This is another slide that shows you TV viewing has gone down by almost an hour on average per week, okay? Mm. So from pre-quarantine and then it went uh, uh, at the ECQ, total number of hours, like almost four hours, uh, more than four hours. And now we're down to like uh, two and a half hours. That's, that's a big drop. Uh, uh, in, in TV, in TV, overall TV viewing. This is the same story. This is from Kantar. I'm just showing you both Kantar and Nielsen. Okay. So that's the end of my, uh, my uh, slides. 
So just those slides were just meant to show you that because of the closure of ABS-CBN, a lot of Filipinos are not getting much, much needed information that ABS should have been provided, should have been providing, okay? And uh, unfortunately, uh, legislative franchise requirement to operate broadcast really puts a burden on us broadcasters, especially at the time when we were trying to renew our franchises. And it really, I, and I agree with everyone that's spoken, it compromises the funeral press, which is our, which we're, what we're celebrating today, and the theme of our of our forum today. It compromises really the freedom of, of press and expression. The uh, ABS event experience really gives us uh, networks, plenty to think about, especially if our franchises are up for renewal. And even if the issues theoretically can be brought up against networks, and, and, and even if we've already renewed our franchises, I think there's still a chilling effect because some of our some of the networks, uh, our members are saying, even if we've already gotten a renewal, it uh, I mean, it doesn't stop government from coming up with issues against you. So you know we're so we're kind of careful about what we do, uh, um, and the president we know has no love lost for ABS-CBN, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, and for, fortunately, unfortunately for ABS-CBN, the president continues to enjoy a high popularity or high approval rating uh, if we're to believe all the surveys that have been conducted. So for us networks, uh, we have to balance the existential problem, which is in the case of ABS-CBN. Uh, we have to balance existential problems, our existential problem with our total news transparency. In other countries, I mean, this is something uh, Melinda and I talked about. In other countries, uh, they don't need eligible franchises to operate a, 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 a network or a, a, to operate yes, a, a radio or a TV station. Uh, I, I did a quick research. They, uh, and, well, I'm familiar with what the U.S. does. The, the reg regulator in the U.S. is the FCC. You don't have to go to Congress and get the franchise. All you need to go to NTC, prove yourself that there's a, an available frequency in an area you want to operate in. Just apply, prove yourself you're, you're, you're financially capable, technically uh, capable, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, every now and then when you have to renew your franchise, you have to prove that you've been complying with all the regulations and, and doing the service that you're supposed to have uh, to be doing, what you promised the FCC. In, in, in U the UK, uh, uh, similarly, uh, the UK is not a congressional thing. Again, it's a it's a it's an executive thing. Uh, TV is uh, um, controlled by the Independent TV Commission or the IT ITC, and radio is controlled by the radio authority. So you can see that in you know in very democratic countries, uh, the legislature is out of the picture. Okay, and mostly these are commissions, and there's uh, and I, we know the commissions are protected by a term, right? So. Uh, they're, 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 they're obviously much immune from, uh, from political uh, influences, okay? So uh, I also mentioned to me in our discussion that in, in the past, not, not in this Congress, but in the previous Congress, there were some congressmen who expressed the opinion that maybe, uh, in fact, one of the congressmen said, why do you even go to us to apply for, you, you know, I don't think you, didn't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't even need a congressional franchise. I think you just go to NDC and that's it. Unfortunately, that's what the Constitution says. I, oh, sorry, that's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution says we need to go to Congress. So the, the ultimate, if you really want broadcast uh, uh, to be really free, uh, maybe we should follow the, the examples of the US, UK, or Japan, by the way. Ja Japan is not the diet who does it. It's the Japanese Ministry of Information and Communication. Again, a, an executive branch, not a legislative branch. Okay, uh, so in the meantime, uh, what what we wanted to do really is to lobby with Congress to change to change uh, the rules. No? Uh, I don't think it's going to happen in this Congress. Uh, so uh, and therefore uh, our member. By the way, ABS-CBN continues to be a member. It has two years to correct the. Uh, our rule says that uh, if a member has some has some uh, or our bylaw says that our, if a member. Uh, uh, is uh, is uh, or incurred some infraction. Franchise. They have they can correct it. Yes, they can correct whatever mm. infraction that is. And in this case, is the, is the yeah. lack of a franchise. Mm. They can correct it within two years. So you have two years from the time they lost their franchise to correct mm. it to remain a KBP member. 
uh, as a regular member. Although, uh, uh, in my recollection, they can they can be an associate member even if they don't have a franchise. But but that does not allow them to be elected in the board nor nor, nor vote, etc. They they lose certain privileges. Okay, so we're just hoping. <clears throat> I mean, right now, ABS-CBN has pivoted. thing into that, and I think Bobby, but is here also congratulates what you're doing. You're doing a fantastic job. And if, even, by the way, uh, uh, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, Jane, your Teleradio is still showing up in the ratings, by the way, even if you're not on free to air. It's <laughs> really getting a significant wow. amount of, of, of audience. So uh, what we just hope in the future either uh, uh, is that uh, maybe the ABS even experience becomes a Blessing in disguise, so to speak, no. Mm -hmm. In the sense that maybe in the future, when when the, a new set of legislators think about this ABS-CBN uh, 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 saga, they might think that we this should not be allowed, mm -hmm. and therefore rules uh, will change. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe not not to make it in the uh, not to give the 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 uh, the fate of a, such an important uh, uh, member of the journalism and the uh, uh, media community Industry. lose its, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, its life, no? Yeah. So, yun lang muna that I'll just, uh, if there yeah. any questions later, we're... we're later, uh, sir. Okay. Maraming salamat, sir. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, interesting study there on viewership. Uh, Maraming din interesado magtanong mamaya. Okay, napag-usapan natin ABS-CBN. Sa na natin. So, let's check on ABS-CBN one year after uh, to give that point of view is a G... Division of ABS-CBN. Hi, Jing. How are you? Hi, Ariel. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Virtual pa rin tayo. <laughs> Okay. Oh Last but not we least, your each turn. Other. We should I stop know, meeting this way. <laughs> 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 well, but thank you, PCIJ, for inviting me. Uh, I am in such good company. And thank you for your kind words, June. Uh, it's been a long time, huh? Anniversary na po din namin eh. Uh, oh, nga. As you know, the shutdown of ABS-CBN's franchise or the broadcast services shutdown took place after we marked World Day last year. It seems so long ago. Uh, uh, that did not happen in our case. It's been almost a year and it continues to be a source of grief for us. So what did we exactly lose? I'll just give you a rundown of, uh, of, uh, of all of that. We've had to lay off about a third. Cutting. We had to cancel our whole current affairs programming. Um, we compressed our program grid for our remaining platforms, Teleradio and ANC. Um, and then of course our radio, what used to be radio and TV broadcasts are now just available on digital. That includes your Facebook, YouTube. Uh, uh, of course we stream them also uh, in our news.abs-cbn.com. Um, of course, we've been losing money. I am very heartening to hear uh, from June that Teleradio continues to be viewed, uh, but it's not making any money. We're continuing to bleed. Uh, and since the shutdown, of course, uh, I think the most worrisome effect is the fear, uh, the chilling effect on, on journalists, both in ABS and outside of ABS. And lastly, the untold mental and emotional anguish that many of us, both those who survived the layoffs and those who lost their jobs suffered and are suffering to this day. So, the shutdown did fast track 
our transformation as a media organization. As you know, we had been trying to reinvent ourselves even years before the ABS-CBN shut down and the killing of our franchise application. We've constantly pursued innovative ways in how we gather and deliver the news. And we also did our best with the help of our research team in the company to really get to know our audience and what find out what they needed from us as a source of news and information. So we made sure we excelled in radio and television, but we also embraced digital early on. We made adjustments in the way we lined up our stories in our news programs. We included news articles in Filipino in our digital news portal. We also produced and published unique video stories in our social media accounts. All these in response to what our news audiences needed. While we were very aware of the mission that we signed up for, we also knew that, especially with the advent of digital, that news consumers of today have so many choices. The digital audience have a whole gamut of online shows, videos, articles, posts, stars, and influencers to click and follow. So our inroads on digital were also uh, supported by new moves, new pursuits in terms of partnerships, as well as efforts to expand our audience. So we pers we, we've continued, um, we pursued partnerships all the time, especially uh, before an election year. Uh, some of you have been uh, very good partners of ABS-CBN for our halalan. Uh, I remember meeting and, and discussing voter education campaigns with a lot of our broadcast partners, including the KBP, of course. And so we also expanded our audience by unblocking uh, some of our content. Uh, that way, anyone in every Filipino, even those outside the Philippines, can watch our programs. So going digital meant limitless possibilities, which gave our people room to explore and experiment, fail and try again until they come up with a good product. Producing for digital is definitely cheaper than for television. But then the sad part of that is TV still rakes in the bigger advertising revenue, way, way bigger. And the reality to this day is that the bulk of our digital content, our digital initiatives and products is still supported by our legacy content. Mm -hmm. That's how important TV Patrol is to us mm -hmm. to this day, even when it is no longer watched uh, on free to air. And despite the fact that it cannot reach a nationwide audience on free TV. So, we had to shut down uh, our current affairs programs because of this. We did not have the financial wherewithal to continue producing those programs without a broadcast platform and its corresponding revenue. Um, same situation with documentaries and those investigative reports that take months to complete. Still, gains, right? ABS-CBN News channel on YouTube has over 12 million subscribers. We have more than 27 million followers in our Facebook account. Our news website is number one in the country in terms of reach. So I believe that we owe much of our digital success to the deep and lasting relationship we've had with our legacy audience. Majority of our digital audience knew us from our ABS-CBN shows. And so as they discovered this new digital platform, uh, social media networks and the others, they also discovered that we were present there. But apart from our TV shows that are not on digital, we also attracted new audience with our unique digital offerings never shown on TV. And that also goes for our entertainment uh, production teams. So currently our digital audience is a good mix of 
users from the Philippines as well as outside the country and also enjoy very strong digital traffic from North America and the Middle East as uh, reported to me recently by our digital team. But there are also challenges. I must point out that our digital gains have their own downside. Disinformation and hate speech, the attacks against the press, against press freedom, the demonization of the news media, we all know that has been fiercest in the digital sphere. The continued attacks against ABS-CBN is also a major concern for our people. It adds to the feeling of uncertainty. The events of 2020 were traumatic for us all, and it does not help that the franchise issue has become a recurring news item, courtesy of some politicians. Some of them well-meaning, but not all. As news chief, part of my job is to boost morale and push everyone to keep going and not lose sight of our purpose as journalists. But that goes with every challenge of every day that news deployment and news coverage uh, is part of. We can no longer use our broadcast transmission equipment, those big trucks that carry our satellite dishes or microwave dishes. They were so useful during coverage of calamities, but they are also part of the services covered by a franchise. Another challenge is access to some offices and agencies that can sometimes be a problem because of the information that they've received that somehow we've been closed and that are no longer uh, operating as a news media. So the difficulties we now face as we cover the news have pushed our teams to tell better stories and to deliver them in the most engaging ways possible. We try to be undaunted. We try to remain in fighting form when it comes to news coverage. The threat of COVID and quarantine restrictions also forced us to make do with what uh, Melinda mentioned at the beginning of this forum, pre-recorded announcements, virtual conferences, that our journalists have also been the target of bashing, of red tagging, gaslighting. The power of social media made by virality a big part of our new reality as journalists, but spin doctors and propagandists have taken advantage of this algorithm-driven feature of social media to threaten or discredit us, organizations and individual journalists both. Today, our biggest challenge remains to be covering the news during a pandemic. We've been following a set of editorial guidelines to ensure that we don't lose sight of the vital information that the public needs to know about COVID-19. The vaccines, the lockdown, the restrictions, how government, how communities are responding to this health emergency. But no matter how strict our safety protocols are, and even while we try to keep our news teams in good health while they do their jobs, the risks are there. And I saw uh, Agnes's presentation a while ago and I couldn't help but relate to. This year has posed new challenges, new difficulties in this front. In fact, we recently lost a beloved colleague to COVID. So we continue to go beyond the statistics. We double our efforts at verifying information and we tell the stories of people, of our people, their communities. Sometimes our editorial decisions lead to major stories, such as the recent incident of Chinese incursion into the West Philippine Sea and within our exclusive economic zone. Our resources have been diminished. We've lost our strong presence in the regions and key cities in other parts of the Philippines. We've lost our nationwide reach. 
Some of our reporters in the regions put up their own businesses. Some have found new jobs. A number of them signed up with new to contribute stories, but only on a freelance basis. This year continues to be tough on ABS-CBN. But despite these challenges and despite the risks, many of us still believe we must continue to fulfill our obligation to the public. And I do believe that if we remain true to those institutional and individual values, we will always muster the courage to keep going with or without a franchise. So thank you for having me today. Thanks, Thank Jane. you, Melinda. Thank you, Ariel. Thanks, Jane, for finding time to join us today. Ramdam kita. Ang hirap lumunok ka ba nang nagsasalita ka? Uh, ang hirap pumiti, ano? As we celebrate, quote unquote, World Press Freedom Day, di ba? We're getting a barrage of questions already, so stay tuned. First question, I, I think, pwedeng sagutin lang to, to, to accommodate. Meron madaming questions eh. Para isang tao lang, isang panelist lang. From Leia May Garcia, how do we keep bias out of stories? Kaya isang panelist ang sumagot nito. We, we, I'll try, Ariel. Uh, everybody has biases. You know that. Uh, our background, our education, our families, they help shape our body. Have editors, producers, and those other officers that make editorial decisions. The reasons we have code of ethics is precisely to address and keep those biases in check. Thank you. Okay, we're getting questions based on the presentation of Mami Lilan also from our panelists. So the question number two, which is also related to question number three, um, how crucial is community media in this time of pandemic and infodemic? How can we assure the community media is not being suppressed? That's from Joy of the Fi Philippine Information Agency, Region 3, related to question number three. How do we start supporting community media outlets right now? Amis the pandemic from Amanda Punzal. I think this question goes to Ami, Ami Kabusao, our colleague from Mindanao, from Davao yeah, City. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I will answer how the, the how do how do we assume assume assure that the media, yeah. the community media, media is not being suppressed. Not, yeah, yeah. We, have, we can't assure that. <laughs> the, the considering the what's happening now, uh, we just do what we can to provide to do our jobs. To be able to uh, to uh, give you assurance that we that we're not suppressed, I don't think um, that that can happen. You know, with all the pandemic and with all the problems that we are facing now, uh, simply for even survival mm -hmm. of the community media. Mm -hmm. ano, ano so the pwedeng, other question, yeah. anong pwedeng support ang pwedeng ibigay para sa community ah, okay. media this support, pandemic? <laughs> providing ads, <laughs> 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 we, we, we you know. Yeah, um, we have to admit that we, we to, to be able to survive and to be able oh. to continue getting news yeah. and yeah. we really need uh, revenues for our newspapers and Correct. and without that um, you don't have anything. So um, if they would want to, if from anybody from the community would like to help the community media, and I think that's uh, <laughs> either they what oh. provide ads. Oh. That's the only thing that I can think of. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. for us to survive See, it, it, because yeah. until now a lot of yeah. A lot of uh, newspapers have ceased printing and um those who are who have been I mean, printing on a daily basis are now cutting their um days to three three days, mm -hmm. two days. Mm -hmm. So it's Sorry. very hard to continue doing our jobs mm -hmm. without revenue coming in. Sorry. So yes, Ariel. Y yan din yung sagot dun sa tanong ni Mamili yes, sa presentation na from the beginning na how regular or irregular uh -huh. ang mga bumalik na mga newspapers niya. Mm -hmm. You will remember in our statistics of oh, PPI, uh, yeah. there are supposed to be 12 that came back, that bounced back. So nag-print, nag-digital sa print, yeah. konting-konti na lang yung yeah. piniprint, mm -hmm. di ba? Tapos nag-digital naman, di pa strong yung presence. Mm -hmm. uh, Magbandang usapin kasi uh -huh. on a national scale, if ABS-CBN is already losing financially, how much more yung mga nasa baba, di ba? Yung mga kasamahan natin ng mga community media, uh, Ma'am Melinda, meron ko pa kayong uh, gusto i-add dito because you also mentioned about the challenges kanina, di ba? I, I, 
I really think that we should think of the community media mm -hmm. as one of the strongest signs of democratic press. I mean, in, in terms of, of the vigor and the numbers that it presents, I, I had always said that, that the growth of the community press since 1986 has been one of the strongest signs yes. that the press in a democracy is actually thriving. So now with the collapse of the market, I how do you help them? I think you have to gather together and basically discuss because there are de development models mm. that can be explored. Sure. I don't have it like at this moment in, yeah. in my head, yeah. but, but, but I Ami think a conversation, yeah. Yeah. a conversation about this involving mm. other regional sources, other international sources yeah. to be true. put on the agenda of anybody who cares about uh, press true. freedom and the community Which, press. Yeah which I already mentioned also a little bit in her presentation on digitalization and other opportunities. Here's some question from, uh, from Verifaz, from Enrico Berdos. Um, out of all the issues currently being faced during the Duterte admin and the COVID-19 pandemic, what issues should be addressed first and why? What are the most urgent steps that need to be done? Anybody? Mamilinda, panelists? question is about what? I mean, there are so many things that we need to yeah. do. Right? Uh, I mean, about particularly, what, can you read that? If, if you can just give very me some general, guidance there. Uh, what, she, he wants us to point out what particular issues talaga dapat i-address natin in this pandemic. Anong mga una? A health crisis ba? Unang-una una yung health crisis talaga mm -hmm. because until the health crisis is addressed in a, in a, in a strategic way, mm -hmm. we are going to be held back and the economy is going to get a weaker and, and the decline of any possibility of, re, of, mm -hmm. of recovery is going to be the burden of, of those who are following in the future generation. Not getting our vaccines. True. Um, and because the, the vaccine, even President Duterte himself from the very beginning said, walang solusyon yan hanggang magkaroon tayo ng vaccine. Ngayon may vaccine, pero hindi pa rin dumarating yung mga supplies ng vaccine that have higher efficacy than the ones that are now available. If we do not ask this question, we know the amounts of money that have been borrowed for it, etc., etc. This is not this is not rocket science reporting. Yeah. And money even wasted. Basically, not only spent, yeah, but wasted and, and, at the same time. And, and, and so to me, really, the greater knowledge about the vaccine program and its failure mm. or its weakness or its weak links or mm. whatever, mm. bakit hinihintay na ma-deliver? models that are happening in the countries that have managed it a little sure. bit better since we already know that we have gone into the borrowings in the billions let us get an accounting on that mm -hmm. yeah uh, that, jonathan that's i the think the most yeah. urgent thing true that's true um, uh, jonathan i think it is also something to do with economic vulnerability of most journalists already struggling even pre pandemic right mm. any reaction to that well yeah i, I agree with mam melinda no? now we have, we do have to First and foremost, we have to address the pandemic. Um, before we even, we can even talk about bouncing back. Um, yeah, um, uh, vaccines and testing. We have to get that under control. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, definitely the pandemic has, has been an, has added to the economic burden of journalists. Um, so yeah, yun, yun ang pinaka, uh, crucial to, to yeah. uh, yeah, I'm just going to segue a bit, uh, not to the next question, but I think about, God controlling the narrative, having said that about health crisis and that journalists, legitimate journalists on all platforms must be giving or dishing out, uh, even giving access to information, all these reports about the pandemic, right? Mm. So, so pa 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 paano mo, uh, we talked about economic vulnerability of journalists, but again, you've got also on the side, um, government controlling the narrative. Mm. Uh, and, mm. uh, yeah, yes. Well, actually, yeah, uh, this this happened last last week lang yung yung memo ng PCOO to uh to compare our pandemic response with world data right yeah um yun, it uh, it makes it even more important now for for journalists to uh look into those claims na parang 
well para ano siya eh we, we can't really define uh, ourselves out of this crisis we have to we have to get the facts and from there we, we can we can find out what we can do moving forward pero we can just say oh we're doing better and then suddenly magaling na tayong lahat um uh, yeah yeah true okay let's go to the next question from Julie Alipala our colleague from uh, Zamboanga apart from ABS-CBN do we have the data of number of journalists displaced or lost his or her job during the pandemic. Uh, kay sa ABS-CBN, meron na, di ba? Um, sa PPI, tinanong kami yan, ah, wala, kami, wala kami data on that. Uh, I don't know if some of our fans, even Ma Melinda, know any of uh, this data uh, in general or NUJP. Yung joblessness ng mga, an, an, ng mga media practitioners. But it is a study that has to be done, I think, in order for us to assess how much has been lost, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But no uh, no organization by itself mm-hmm. is going to be able to find out unless the existing community news organizations begin to collect that data and then submit, uh, you know, submit it to a process where it can then become a study and a report mm-hmm. based exactly on how the news organizations are reporting from the ground. Uh-oh. That's where we start. I mean, you know, we don't have the data. We could not attempt the data without going to the ground, which we cannot, uh, you know, CMFR does not have that kind of resource. Mm-hmm. It would not be able to do it. We would have to depend on the digital yeah. connection of the gathering of that data. And I don't think that's completely impossible. Yeah. So it's going to be a huge effort, Liba Mamilida, up until the end of the pandemic, even post-pandemic, right? So here's another question. Yes. Uh, you want to say something, ma'am? No. Okay, shall we proceed to the next question from Elver? Is it Elver? Yeah. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Uh, of Barangay Hub in Visayas. Okay. Here goes. In the context of ABS-CBN being shut down and staying that way for almost a year now, how do we see press freedom in the Philippines in the years or even the months to come? Uh, Sir Jun and then Jing, <laughs> who wants to go first? Well, from from the standpoint, uh, I think I kind of inhibited the uh, young. Uh, uh, industry are kind of, I mean, uh, careful about what they say. <laughs> uh, I think I, I'd mentioned that. No, I, you don't want to. <laughs> And I, I mentioned this in our in my talk uh, in my discussion with Melinda as well. No, we you don't want to get into the bad side of because, because as as Melinda me, 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 uh, presented in her presentation, you know this is a, a, a this president uh, this administration uh, the culture that is being inculcated in this in this administration has been that of a strong 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 man kind of a, a, a um, rule. No, so. Someone who posted that they recall some, uh, you know, when Marshall was declared and all that. It may not be as bad as that because, uh, as, as we all know, when Mar- Marshall was declared, all of us, you know, just got put off the air. Uh, but the, it, it gives you that kind of a feeling, it, uh, uh, that kind of thing. So, as, as I mentioned in, in my reaction, uh, we really have to think twice about, you know, uh, Keeping our franchise versus uh, you know being free to talk about whatever, mm-hmm. but just to to, re- to react on on uh, know uh, uh, about the uh, the government's response to the pandemic, I think the, uh, the the problem we have right now is there's no clear plan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think they know what they're doing. I mean, uh, that, that's I think the reaction here, no, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of people are saying that. I mean, I, I was just amazed at the you know. Uh, some some conflicting uh, uh, pronouncements, for example, by by between Secretary Duque and uh, General General Galvez, when the General Galvez said that we'll we'll definitely go, going to be back to normal by the end of the year, and uh, Secretary Duque says uh, after after I think a few a few hours or so or uh, uh, one day, he completely says it's the uh, a completely different story. So you know. I mean, in terms of messaging, I don't know what the message really is because I get I I, I get confused about uh, dep- uh, about what the message really is, and you know, uh, spokesman uh, Harry Rocco will may, may say another thing, and yeah. and then the president will say another thing. So, my my, my own feeling is that I don't think they have a plan, uh, and they're really confused about how to solve this problem. Yeah. Uh, there is def- Yes. Yeah. 
it, there is definitely a problem mm -hmm. in that sense that from the very beginning, when there was obviously no plan, mm -hmm. and it was clear that there was no plan, the press held back in saying that directly because they felt that it should not be, it should not be their role to 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 say it. Mm -hmm. It came out in some of the editorials, but in truth, mm -hmm. the news accounts just kept citing the government sources and the government sources it was obvious that there was no plan the interpretation of what you get from these statements is what now the media must learn to do it's already a little bit too late because we've already lost so much time but let me ask all those people who are asking questions about what the press can do the press can do very little unless the people themselves know that it is really up to them for them to speak up and to say, we would like to get this information, we would like to have this direction, we would like to be served by the government that we are paying for. Yeah. That's where it has to come out to. That's why I keep saying it really all depends on where the people are. Yeah. And if the people are going to be afraid, then really, I think we have lost so much of what we are fighting about. Jean, do you have a reaction to that question? Uh, you want to reply well, to that uh, on the press freedom? I would, just uh, like, I, uh, I would just like to say this, okay? Um, the press mm -hmm. is maybe the even the leading, the press is the leading protector mm -hmm. of our freedoms, of our rights. But if the pre if press freedom itself is under siege, then you can see uh, a problem. Um, you can see a lot of false equivalence. You can see some stories that are not told. Uh, you will see a lot of, you know, walking on eggshells on certain issues. That's what you can expect. Yeah. So, uh, Melinda's right. Uh, it's up to the people. We deserve the, the media environment, the media industry that we have, perhaps. Uh, but I also believe that we can be a little more courageous mm -hmm. as media, as journalists. We can uh, revisit our values. We must, you know, be less afraid. Quite a challenge there, uh, Jingano. Okay. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Here's another question. I think it's oft, uh, related to the oft-repeated um, notion on chilling effect and experience a chilling effect from Romel Lopez. Uh, do all our panelists agree that other broadcast networks have become timid in covering the administration after they've received been shut down? I'm saying about the chilling effect because there are lots of students watching us or in the meeting right now, watching us live on FB streaming. I think it uh, it begs for another explanation. Ano ba yung chilling effect na yun na lagi natin sinasabi? It's mabuting ilabas natin uli para alam ng totoo yun yung chilling effect na yun, hindi yung chill, chill, chill. <laughs> Di ba? Di ba? Okay, please. Uh, good question from Romel, our colleague also from uh, uh, yes? Oh. Yan, Jonathan, sige. Oo. Sige. Sige, uh, I think Toto to ba? Naging, nag naging timid na ba? In the case of Philippine Star kasi, sa platform mo. <laughs> okay, then, that, that's another case. Here, please, go, go, go. Please, sorry. Okay. Well, I, I think you know, the fact that we're even using the term care, uh, careful in this forum right now uh, shows that there is such an effect. I mean, okay. hindi naman natin pwedeng sabihin na it doesn't affect us. We, we, can't, we can't look at what happened to ABS-CBN and not wonder parang, oh, kung kaya nila ABS-CBN, what about us? Um, yeah, but uh, there are ano, there are spaces, there are inches. Para siko, we, we have to keep pushing, kahit inches lang in, uh, to keep going. Um, uh, but yeah, to answer the original question, we have been careful. Careful, careful and timid. Okay, kiri sa ko sa isasagot ni ano, Sir June, kasi insider ka or uh, outsider sabi na din natin. Look at all, all, looking at all these issues on the, the broadcast, etc. Press in general. Meron bang ganon? Did you feel that? Or there is there a study on that? Na timid or careful yung ano? Um, yung media office natin. Alam mo, pag pinag-usapan namin, general. when we talk about that, Ariel, uh, we will never admit it. Okay. But, but deep inside, alam ko, there is. 
clear, there, there is definitely. In the newsroom, you would, you would feel it. No? Yeah. But when we, I mean, when we, uh, you know, meet as a, as a collegial body, as a, as a KBP, for example, we have our GMs. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. When that issue comes about, uh, we kind of brush it aside and say, we're out, matapong pa rin kami. Ah, but the truth so, is in there. Uh, merong admission, Sir June, pero hindi na pinag-uusapan yun kasi it's already a given. Yeah, I, I, that, that's my own take, yes. Okay, yes, okay, yes. okay. Yes. I, 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 know. I, I get it. Okay, uh, any more um, answer to the question from Romel? Pamilinda? Like, like, can I, yeah, can I just add that sure. part of my report basically noted how in our media monitor we already identified the different kinds of thematic concerns mm. that were mm. not covered mm. at all from 2016. You see, it did not even take the closure of ABS-CBN mm. to mm. silence, to silence so many and or to allow the news agenda to be controlled completely by government. It started mm. from the very beginning mm. because mm. here was a person who basically looked and talked and mm. sounded like he will do anything in order mm -hmm. to get his way. Many of us have gone through periods like that in our history. Mm -hmm. We did not want to go through that again. again. At the same time, many were in like some Pollyanna bubble, especially the young people who basically don't even Responding to this challenge now lies, I think, in the next generation. While we, older generation, continue to plod on and hopefully show up and flag the, yeah. the, the warning signs and everything, yeah. there has to be the greater energy and the fearlessness of youth that will commit and say, and leading to the election, yeah basically to deliver a message that we will turn a page. True, true. Think about it. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. We are yeah. going to be here. Given the role of China in geopolitical landscape, we are going to be here for the longest time, and this is going to be a completely different country true. for true. those of you who are growing up in it. Yeah. Jonathan, there's a challenge there. Si Mamilin is looking at you for young people like us now. <laughs> Oh, but that's passing that mm. Buti na lang, buti na lang, Ariel, parang hindi na ako ka-age group ni Jonathan. <laughs> Pero hindi na mahala. Kasama ka pa. You know, ito yung... Oh, but, around, but around, seriously, you know, you know, seriously, I, I should point out and we should remember that the elections of 2022 could be the most consequential, consequential. Of, of all our elections. You're right, sir. Okay. It's important to remember yeah. that. Al alam nyo, kasi wag mo natin tantanan tong question na to, kasi my last question related to, relation to this, is for Ami. Si Ami, babad talaga sa community, community journalist, ano, Mindanao Times and all. Ami, matagal na tayong tinatanong dito. Sa observasyon mo ba, atin ating pag pinuusapan natin sa PPI, among us print, ano, mer meron bang ganong ano, meron, you get that feel na careful, timid, uh, may, takot, sabi natin takot, ang ating mga kasamahan na mag, mag report I think Thomas Kimamilida, this is not the right time to be ano ano. Uh, let's say it uh, as it is. You get the feel. I think our audience, our audience deserves that uh, kind of ano um, explanation from from us, from the community media, from somebody like you, na matagal na. Ami. Ito naman to mga problem pinag uusapan natin. Is still is Ami still there? Ami. Ay, Ami. I think okay. nawala. Nawala si Ami, baka yung connection niya. Uh, okay, sige, balikan na lang natin, Mami, because there are other questions pa. This is particularly for Sir June, ha, para sa iyo to. Uh, okay, taka muna. Uh, ito na, ito na. Okay. Um, no, this is not for you pala. There's another question pa. How ka, in terms of safety, Sila, sila Jonathan sa NUJP, mga kasagot ito, we've talked about safety for the longest time. Uh, people never, how can we have a safe, this is from John Isidore Laurel, how can we have a safe environment for the press to inform the public? Or is there a safe place for the press amidst recorded, recorded cases involving threats and challenges as watchdogs? Very interesting. Well, 
Uh, initially, you know, the answer would be to prepare ourselves uh, through safety training. Pero ang tunay na sagot dyan would be for government to act on uh, attacks against journalists to, uh, to make sure that those who harass or intimidate us will will be held to account. Um, Siyempre, we have, we, we have to be proactive by uh, making sure that we're safe. But yung uh, burden talaga dyan is for government to ensure na we are actually safe. Mm-hmm. Safe ba? Ito ha, ano lang to? Safe, safe ba, Jonathan, habang nag-wonder tayo in the comforts of our home? That, is that how safe we are? Pwede bang, uh, no. pwede bang sabihan ganon? Na hindi tayo lumalabas to cover but basically we're doing all these things by a webinar in the comforts of our home. That, huh? just, that, that just make it safe? Not necessarily. Um, okay. Kasi may digital threats mm-hmm. na. At saka, uh, we've also seen na ang, your, yung home mo is not necessarily... A haven, pwede naman pasukin yan if... Hmm. Not secure uh, at all. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay, any more uh, answers apart from Jonathan's answer to this question? Okay, uh, we proceed to the next question. Uh, uh, Ariel, I, Ariel, sorry. I okay. think, I, I, sir I think Melinda and I want to, want to react to that. Sure, sure, uh, sure. In our experience kasi, I think uh, the, in the case of uh, journalists, I, I mean, Emily will, will, will agree or disagree with me on this one. But... Uh, I think in in uh, a, a lot of a large percentage of uh, violence against media uh, practitioners are because they, the the uh, the vic the the subject of the of uh, media news is not uh, is not given the chance to react. I think that's okay. that's one of the things. So, mm-hmm. uh, and if you notice, uh, it's borne out by the fact that a lot of the uh, victims on broadcast, at least, are those uh, with black time with black time uh, programs. And the black timers are not, you know, they're they're usually, uh, they're they're usually oh, they buy time to to for their own purpose. They, so they they will not allow their kalaban to to react, and that's the reason for that. So uh, what what we are uh, advocating the KBP is is precisely that to avoid uh, to to lessen the threat of, of violence against uh, okay. practitioners. Make mm-hmm. sure that you give. A chance for the for your subject to react. And in fact, that's that's contained in our broadcast uh, code. Uh-uh. As long as you follow the broadcast code, that you give equal opportunity to react. Because mm-hmm. if they don't, if they don't have any choice, you don't, they're not allowed. Uh, you 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 ruin their name. Uh, they're not allowed to answer. They resort mm-hmm. to violence. That that's uh, true. I think what's what's happened uh, in a lot of cases. Okay. Before I go to Mom Melinda, who also would like to answer that question. Ito yung next question for you. Na related to sa binanggit mo kanina about being careful. Here's one question from Mark Lester Chico of UPLB uh, and fight FYT community. By being careful, what exactly do you mean, Sir Junik? Now, does this affect how we frame our news about Malacanang or how we present our truths vis-a-vis Malacanang's truths? Okay, <laughs> I think the, the the what you mean by that is mainly about uh, you know getting into the bad side of the the people that matter or the person that matter. If you notice, I mean, uh, uh, it's it's really more about going all the way up. Uh, your I know, but I think as far as the executive or the other uh, people in government, I think for for most for most of that, I think it's. Uh, it's uh, you know fair game, no. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really getting to the bad side. I mean, if you look at it, as, uh, uh, in the case of uh, the, the case of ABS-CBN, I mean, if you talk to the legislators, a lot of them, wala na, wala naman silang tinapis sa ABS. Eh. It's just that they, they, uh, they, they got the. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> You ask Jing. <laughs> tanong, tanong mo si Jing or Bobby Barrero. But Bobby Barrero is in this call. Walang, ala. <laughs> Totoo ba yan? Walang masamang tinapay. Parang, I don't know. <laughs> no, for the most part, it's just that. Isa lang naman okay. ang tao kayo kung sabi mo. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, or a uh, particular person, siguro. <laughs> Not time to identify them. <laughs> so, if I said question, ano, uh, para pero, dun. Pero, totoo si naman yung sinabi. Totoo naman, just to to follow through on what John presented, Mm -hmm. it's very clear that the Congress is dominated by the executive. And what the executive says goes as far as the Congress is, Mm -hmm. is, is. they are limited, I think, Mm -hmm. in their interpretation. And later on, he will say, it's not with me, it's with them. And then in the end, 
President Duterte actually said, mm -hmm. I was able to bring down the, down, oligarchs, the oligarchs, yeah. owners uh -huh. of. So where is the story there? Did we get that story very clear right after? We did not. That's again, we're going into the care and the caution and not having to rock the boat and not having to offend so the and protection. Right, right. We have been doing all the work of protection has been one of our clear programs in CMFR. It has and and one of the key challenges was to explain why there are so many journalists being killed in this country. I think we have gone through quite a lot of those explanations. Mm -hmm. I also think it is because while media is seen as a prominent celebrity, everything, etc., etc., the things that you identify with power and the things that you identify with appeal and popular support, etc., etc., when it comes to the news, most Filipinos have not come to the appreciation of what that is. Perhaps in all those lost territories that ABS-CBN no, can no longer bring the news of the day. Maybe there they're beginning to sense, mm. oh my God, I don't even know what's going on anywhere, anywhere, anymore. Mm. And so let us put down the, the on tablet. There is no free press without the people wanting to defend that free press. Yeah. Our press freedom depends mm -hmm. on how much support we have yeah. from the people. And the trolls, they scratched on a little wound there where they saw some maybe of the abuse that was going on on the part of some mm. of the practitioners of the press because it is an imperfect institution. But they scratched that a little bit and basically mm. made it as though biblical finding mm. masama ang legacy press, masama mm. ang mainstream press. It was a uh, form of brainwashing. And even so, bastardized. So, yeah. the, so to me, the whole... Yeah challenge has to be confronted not by the press that has become so much more vulnerable mm -hmm. although mm -hmm. they have to do their part they have mm -hmm. to do their part mm -hmm. it really is a challenge to the rest of society in this country to everyone who cares what our future is about sure. as a democracy yeah. to everyone who cares about whether we have a press at all or not yeah that's true Okay, uh, we're running out of time. We're going to have the last two questions from Nona Espina and also from Rachel Khan. Uh, Nona asked, well, there was a clear clamor and pushback from the public. Do you think media did enough to try to prevent ABS-CBN's closure? If not, why? Fear, favor, competition? There. <laughs> What's to go first? I might have to what, inhibit what, what, myself what? from answering that, Ariel. <laughs> inhibit. <laughs> oh, well, what, yes. <laughs> I might be biased, what, you know. What would have been the most dramatic statement of institutional solidarity was to go silent mm -hmm. for a day or two or three or to block off periods in which they say we can no longer function. The attack on ABS-CBN is attack on us. Mm -hmm. And that is what FMFA is about. Yeah. Freedom yeah. for media. Freedom for all, yeah. Happens to all. Let's bring that home. Let's bring that, let's take that to heart. And. It will open up all kinds of ways of responding in the future. Hopefully, we will never have to face this challenge again. Um, yeah. Any more addition from uh, the other panelists? No, I think G can also, you know, say something on that. Well, yeah, well yeah, it, it's been it's been observed uh, by not a few mm. that. In this country, there is no such thing as media solidarity. That is pretty obvious. So that's really what uh, was lacking. Uh, of course, there were, you know, uh, news media agencies, newspapers, mm. uh, other stations that covered uh, the franchise hearings. But 
the, the kind of solidarity that was needed at that time was more than that, involved more than that, involved a commitment mm. and uh, a symbolic act that uh, would have shown how strong we were together and that did not happen. Yeah. Jonathan? Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think a lot of us, well, a lot of media nga, uh, limited ourselves to just parang helping through our coverage um, by covering anyway. Um, well, ayun, hindi nga siya nag-work. No? So, yeah. Uh, maybe we didn't get yeah. Uh, Ma Melinda, I've been wanting to ask this. This is off the cup question uh, for so long a time. And itong sa time na to, ito na, it's been at itong time na to. Ha, bakit tayo highly polarized and divided media? I think the, the um, audience wants I, to know I, that. I question. really, let, yeah, let me get back to some history. You know, we used to have a national press club. The national press club was a beautiful building on the show, on the banks of Pasig River. It used to be a gathering place. It was a place where people brought guests because we wanted to show that whatever rival companies, we were always one community and we belonged to this place. What happened there, I think, because of the hyped up, kind of branding, we lost our way. We lost all the inter-news inter organization affairs that used to be a hallmark. If you belong to the press, then you were part of this. And we let go of that mm -hmm. for all kinds of reason. Kapamilya, kapuso, that was part of the division. Mm -hmm. That was part of the division, that stars of one could not perform in another. And all those sorts of divisions. We had no basketball tournaments. We had no golf tournaments. We had no gridiron where we all got together and basically made fun of the people that we subjected. We have to recover that. Mm -hmm. And so tell me, uh, you ask me why there has been no institutional solidarity because we allowed all kinds of other organizational or commercial the commercial branding of what we do get in the way of building up institutional solidarity and that is where we have to go back that is where i hope the younger generation will return and that all of us here, whatever age, should begin to support that communal, collective sense of good. Let's not forget that we belong and we are only stronger as our weakest link. Right. Any more, uh, Sir Jun, before I proceed to our final question, last question. Okay, Nasugoro, are you okay? Okay, okay. I don't know if it's a fitting uh, close to our open forum or QA, but here's one from uh, Dr. Rachel, Professor Rachel Khan from UP. What is your opinion about seeking the support, moral or financial, from foreign media institutions and coalitions like the Global Media Freedom Coalition? I think before we seek the foreign aid, we need to, to consolidate our unity mm -hmm. because otherwise the intervention of some in, uh, foreign agency will again highlight the greater divisions. We need to do it all together and that before we call on whoever, whatever, we should establish our consensus about how we grow out of this particular problem. We should keep that in mind. We should be in link. We should be in touch with all of these other efforts from which we can draw strength, but we cannot do it in competition with one another. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any more answers to that? Jonathan, Ami. Ami, let's have Ami. Ami, are you back? Meron problema yata sa connection ni Ami. It's that crappy internet connection once again, ladies and gentlemen, all the time. So it happens to the best of us. Ami, are you there? Because we're closing the Q&A already. Ami, wala pa rin. Sinong gusto pang sumagot dito about uh, getting support from uh, 
um, foreign media institutions. Uh, any more take yeah, on I that? Yeah, I believe, Ariel, I yes, think Jane. I believe, yeah, I believe we should first get our acts together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are so threatened on so many fronts. Uh, we have the algorithm-driven social media that is really responsible for all, all the proliferation of hate speech, disinformation, mm -hmm. trolling, bashing. Mm -hmm. We have to address that. We have to address the mm -hmm. fact that uh, news publishers are not given enough credit nor revenue share mm -hmm. in these social media platforms. Mm -hmm. um, we have to strengthen ourselves and we have to also look at ourselves and, and mm -hmm. do some reflection and introspection, introspection. too about, mm -hmm. about what weaknesses, what flaws we can correct. And that and only that will be the should be the first move uh, among many of us. True. Yeah. Okay. Very good. You mentioned that as we wrap up the Q and A, it's like interesting to finally, you know, close the Q and A. I think this is going to be your final, uh, final speeches or final words from this question from Julie Alipala. Going back to our theme on World Press Freedom Day celebration in the Philippines, at least in our um, setting, given from Julie Alipala, given the current challenges journalists encountered. Duterte admin, pandemic, etc. Meron pang madami -dami. Do we still break barriers to inform the public? Short final words from each of the panelists, from Mami Linda to the last uh, panelist, please. Um, do we continue to break barriers? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. there is no other answer. Do we continue to take steps forward? Oh. Yes. And whether or not um, those steps will lead us perfectly on some path or or it'll take us on various detours, we should be ready at all times to break barriers because that is part of the challenge that we face. Yeah, kailangan mas matapang pa, Mami Linda. Is that saying, huwag nang careful, careful. Huwag nang timid, timid. Kailangan talagang Huh? Okay. Kasi ah, okay. pagsama-sama, hindi masyadong takot. Okay, yeah. Pagsama-sama tayo strength, lahat. Hindi strength tayo in takot. numbers. Strength in numbers. Mm. That's what solidarity is all about. Uh, Jonathan, um, how do you get yes. barriers to inform the public at this point of uh, of the pandemic and populist leadership? Um, I think, no. Bukod sa breaking barriers uh, amongst ourselves, I think we need to also break barriers and uh, bring more people into the conversation. Uh, mm. If that means talking to more than the usual elite sources, then we should do that. Um, I think that will bring more people to to, to support us, but bigger buy-in because they're part of the conversation. They're part of they're part of the situation um, instead of just uh, quoting senators or these experts. Um, there is space. Oh, there is space for regular people, for people who aren't always featured in the news. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that also giving more voice to the voiceless, you know, the oft uh, exhausted diba? expression mm. natin, ito, magbabad, etc. and all. Diba? There's more to that than really, you know, uh, providing a platform, etc. And let's go to uh, Amy, your final words on that uh, last question from uh, Kita yeah, Julie. Uh, of, uh, I Hello, are you Yes, well? you're back. Hello, Good, you're back. Yeah, finally. Yeah, because <laughs> because I've been muted. I cannot. <laughs> yeah. Ah, so I think, how come? I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, um, yes, we're crossing barriers for co the community media, mm. for the print media, for instance. Mm. Mm. We're really now trying to go uh, to survive by um, optimizing the digital platform, for instance, and see where we can go from there to be creative, be innovative, uh, just for us to to what's this um to go through this pandemic to go through all these problems and mm -hmm. be very um positive about all these things now, mm -hmm. i believe in i that's that's why i really believe in um um chair as the video when he said that um uh, it's time for us to look forward and, mm -hmm. and look at these things as challenges that will make us better in the end sing it ko lang, Ami, but not leaving print not leaving print, okay. yeah, we have both, ano, especially at this time. Print will not be dead, I hope. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. in our lifetime. <laughs> Thanks, Ami, for joining us today. Sir Junik Dao? But the the short, long and short answer to that, of course, uh, Ariel, we need to continue. That, that, that's that's the mandate we we have. No, although, although I'm probably the 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 odd man here because I'm the only one who's not really a, a journalist. <laughs> anyway, but so um, my, my view is that of course we have to uh, we have to continue to break barriers. Uh, but it doesn't mean that breaking barriers uh, means we're we're stepping on toes and all that. As long as I think we practice good journalism as long as we make sure that we give equal opportunity to all parties uh, and as long as yeah. we, we take our role as journalists, as I said, <laughs> just admit I'm not the journalist by profession, um, I, um, as long as we exercise responsibility in the way we carry our task, I don't, I don't really see any problem. Oh. And, uh, Sir Jun, uh, before Jean Reyes. Ah, yung binanggit na kanina, not legislating franchises is a long shot to uh, what we really want no, to happen. Ma For, mahabang tatahakin yeah. pa nun. Oh. Yeah. Kasi ang, uh, I think the, the reason why I say that is because uh, I don't think we have enough time uh, until uh, when this Congress is, mm -hmm. uh, when this Congress finishes its, uh, mm -hmm. its, um, I don't know, its term. Uh, it, it really takes, a, a, una una, you have to have enough um, a critical mass of uh, uh, legislators who believe in in the in the idea, so it, it really takes a lot of groundwork to to push that uh, uh, that idea forward. Yeah. And I I, I think uh, obviously the the earlier we start on on the idea, I think the, the better it is. No, but I'm saying it 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 will take a lot of, of uh, hard work to to, to true, get it true, passed. True. Thanks, Sir June and KDP for joining us today. And last but not least is Jing Jing. Uh, ABSM broke bars even before the pandemic. Uh, you broke digital, etc. Uh, you also bring in you know, a lot of viewers story and change the landscape of digital in the Philippines. Um, uh, what more in terms of breaking barriers, uh, uh, information, access to information, um, I suppose, on the part of ABS-CBN? What's left of ABS-CBN at this point during the pandemic? Well, of course, ABS-CBN and its news organization is trying its best mm -hmm. to survive. Uh, but I believe in uh, I believe that delivering information is a public good, and that uh, that is the essential service of journalism. And we are trying to fulfill that no matter what. I also believe in our profession's capacity to be working to have hired some of the finest young journalists in the country today. And I think as long as we guide them and mentor them and allow them the freedom to pursue truth, to pursue stories as aggressively as possible, as completely as possible, and if we allow them to be brave enough in the pursuit of these stories, then we can maybe force people to do the right thing. I think that's what we are here for and we should never lose sight of what our purpose is. Yeah. Short of saying we still have, you know, long way to go in really engaging more the public natin. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like the word that you binagit mo kanya. It's really service. It's about journalism is service. Yes. Right? The essential service. Yes. And that's why we're here. Sure. Thanks very much, Jingres, for joining us at ABS-CBN. At this point, I, you know, ako man gusto ko i-accommodate. Ang dami-dami pang questions talaga. Sunog na sunog na yung ano natin. Yung... Uh, yung, uh, tawag ito, yung pages natin, yung phones natin sa mga questions, but I hope uh, uh, we are we were able to answer most of your questions kasi pinagsama-sama na natin yung lahat, di ba, yung related questions. At this point, ang hope ko lang din, uh, as we want to discuss some more of, uh, of of all these issues, sana meron pang tayong, mag, karoon pa tayong ibang discussions nito. Mamilinda, Sir June Jonathan, uh, PCIJ, PPI, AMI, and all. Itong mga organisasyon na to. Let's get in some more organizations kahit hindi naman, hindi magkatugma ng paniniwala. Siguro, one step to to solidifying or how, however that means. Um, long way to go. <laughs> Pero at this point, let's have the synthesis and closing from uh, the PCJ Executive Director, very good friend, Carmela S. Juan Buena. Hi, Carmela. Ang daming, ano, ano? Ang daming pwedeng sabihin. Ang init. Ang init ng usapan. Ang init. Good oh, afternoon. Ang daming sabihin. Thank you very much for staying on until, you know, uh, the final hour of our discussion. Take it away. 
Good afternoon, everyone. We at the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism are very happy to be spending today World Press Freedom Day with our fellow journalists, even only virtually. So I will summarize very briefly the rich discussion we had today. Mr. Ming Koklim of UNESCO Jakarta spoke of information as a public good, highlighting the importance of independent media and the need to keep journalists safe. UNESCO is looking at three challenges, the viability of media and news organizations amid the current environment, the transparency of online platforms, and the link between media and information literacy, countering disinformation and hate speech. He also highlighted how the pandemic increased the pressure on journalists, exacerbating existing challenges, including financial losses. He also spoke of the way false information has flourished, sometimes with fatal consequences. Our main speaker, Ms. Melinda De Jesus, Executive Director of the Center for Media Freedom and Responsibility, presented the state of media freedom in the Philippines in the current ad administration of President Rodrigo Duterte. Ms. Melinda comprehensively detailed how the attacks and threats on the Philippine media are a part of, a co of the country's drift to authoritarianism under President Duterte, who has behaved, as she said, quite unlike a democratic government. He promoted the status of the police and military to establish control on civilian life. She raised many concerning issues, including um, in the context of the cancellation of the franchise of ABS-CBN, she asked why franchise power should continue to be under the control of political hands. She also questioned the red tagging of journalists perpetrated by the ntfl -CAP. Pandemic heightened securitization of all government conduct she is concerned that the damage inflicted on access to information and press freedom practice would become permanent. But there's good news. She celebrated journalists who continue to sustain the functions of the fourth estate despite the, def the difficult situation. There are those who continue to show courage to speak truth to power. But she also expressed concerns over the way the media has been divided over the issues, over many issues. She highlighted the importance of the coming elections. She asked, are we going to turn the page or do we stay with the status quo? She also presented at least 223 incidents of attacks and threats against journalists from June 30, 2016 to April 30, 2021, based on the monitoring of CMFR and the National Union of Journalists of the Philippines or NUJP. State agents were linked to more than half of these cases or a total of 114 incidents. This is a notable increase, she said. Mr. Jonathan DeSantos, chairperson of the NUJP, expounded on these challenges faced by the media. He spoke of the troubling trend of red tagging of journalists by the security sector. In one awkward situation, one journalist covering a Senate hearing had to leave quietly because she was surprised to be red, tag red tagged in that very hearing. Journalists face threats regularly over critical stories. Some of these threats were sent anonymously. These attacks didn't stop during the pandemic. He also spoke of the problem with shrinking editorial budgets, which has left many journalists vulnerable in the field. He highlighted the need for a united media response to these attacks and threats. Ms. Amalia Cabusao of the Philippine Press Institute spoke of the devastating impact of the pandemic on community media. Many of them were already suffering from dwindling revenue before the pandemic. They are now gasping for breath, she said in order to survive. The papers are also shrinking due to the growing cost of materials. They are losing revenues because no new ads are coming in for some of them. There are big stories that only the members of the community press are able to cover right now. This include conflicts that the pandemic didn't stop, um, the continuous delays suffered by the rehabilitation of Marawi, and the red tagging in communities. But the lack of resources has been has been so problematic that there's not enough protection for journalists going to the field. There are not enough PPEs. Mr. Roberto Nikdao of the Kapisana ng Broadcaster ng Pilipinas or KBP spoke of the dip difficult battle for ABS-CBN to renew its franchise. He said it was clear that ABS-CBN was shut down not because they violated rules. These alleged violations were sufficiently addressed, he said. Even if ABS-CBN may have committed some violations, in Mr. Nickdow's view, these violations cited during the hearings did not merit the death of a network. This could have been settled very easily, or they only merited a fact. Building on a topic that Ms. Melinda introduced, Mr. Nickdow presented how in other countries, broadcast networks actually do not need congressional franchises to operate. There are different bodies granting franchises. 
out of political hands and he suggested that perhaps we should begin to work to lobby Congress to change the rules. He ended with a hopeful note that maybe the ABS saga can be a blessing in disguise if this can lead to amendments in the rules of granting franchises. Ms. Jean Reyes of ABS-CBN recalled how the shutdown of ABS-CBN franchise happened after we all celebrated World Press Freedom Day last year. ABS-CBN lost a lot since then. The network laid off a third of its workers. It had to do drastic cost cutting, cancel its current affairs programming, and compress its program grid. It has been losing money, but the most worrisome effect, she said, is the chilling effect on journalists and the untold mental and emotional anguish that many of them continue to suffer. The shutdown fast-tracked the transformation of ABS-CBN to digital. It has grown its presence on the internet, moving their legacy audiences online as it invites new audiences. The network has been working hard to fulfill its duty to inform the public and maintain its legacy programs. However, digital gains have their downside, she said, including disinformation and hate speech. Despite these challenges, Ms. Jean Reyes ended her presentation with a promise that ABS-CBN will keep going with or without franchise. And then the discussion during the open forum were just as rich. We discussed how to keep our bias out of stories. How do we help the community press to make sure that they are not suppressed? How, we how do we turn the trend where the government control the flow of information? Um, have journalists become timid? And there was a reiteration of the importance of the coming 2022 elections. And a lot of other things that we need to do moving forward, but primarily we need to get our acts together according to the speakers and unite because there is strength in numbers and we are breaking barriers, but we will need to be ready to continue breaking barriers to do our jobs. In closing, these are really challenging times, but we are celebrating this day, World Press Freedom Day, for the continued courage and dedication of Filipino journalists to hold the line for press freedom, despite threats, despite attacks. And it is with this fighting spirit that the Philippine news organizations and individual journalists are releasing today a collective statement against the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 for trampling upon fundamental freedoms, including the freedom of the press. I'll quote a paragraph in the statement. We are saying that government's assurance that protection clauses are in place fly in the face of the experience of news organizations and journalists who have been red tagged and branded as terrorists. We will be publishing this statement shortly on our websites and social media page pages. With that, we end our program today, but but may we continue to find strength in each other and together we will hold the line for press freedom. Happy World Press Freedom Day. Good afternoon. Thanks, Carmela. Thanks, PCIJ. Thanks, everyone. To our webinarists, our webinarists, no? Nasa meeting, maraming salamat. We're staying on until uh, the end of the program. To all those who are watching, watching us via live Facebook streaming, thanks very, very much for joining us. To our main presenter, Mamilinda Desus, thanks very much for the example discussion. Also to our panelists, Jonathan, Sir Nick, Amy, uh, Miss Jing, uh, uh, yeah, and all those who ask questions as well. Maraming salamat po sa inyo lahat. This was organized, this forum was organized by the Freedom for Media Freedom for All Network, by the NUJP, uh, CMFR, PCIJ, Minda News, PPI, in collaboration with UNESCO, Jakarta. Maraming salamat po sa for all of you, for those of you who want to have certificates of participation, you must answer the survey, uh, no, not the survey questionnaire. Is that a survey question? The evaluation form first. Uh, it's post posted on the chat room before you can get your certificates of merit or participation. Thanks, everyone. Mabuhay ang malayang Pilipinong mamamahayag. Keep safe and be well, everyone. Goodbye. Until the next celebration next year. Thank you. Ay, thank you.